Good morning. Mwana Sifiwe. It is wonderful to have you here with us today. What a joy and what a privilege we have from our God to be gathered together in his name this Sunday morning. If you're a visitor, please feel welcome. This is Calvary Chapel. We, we love you and we, we love God's word. And we are going to dive right into it. We are in Acts chapter 24. If you hold your fingers there, then we'll pray and get to it. Our Heavenly Father, a gracious King, we thank you for another privilege uh, to be gathered in your name, Lord. I pray that your Spirit will be at work in us as we read your word publicly as you have commanded us, Lord. I pray that the reading of your word, the meditation of it will enlighten us and cause us to live in a way that is um, worthy of your cross. So help us, God, as we receive your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue uh, with our study through the Bible, and book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and today we are in the 24th chapter of the book of Acts. Um, a continuation, really, it's a, the flow of thought continues from chapter to chapter. We just break it because of time. But last week, we saw how um, a group of men, the Jewish men, uh, right about 40 of them, had vowed, they made a vow that they're not going to eat nor drink uh, unless, you know, Paul is down on the ground. They want him dead. And their plan got into the commander and uh, through God's providence, he was escorted by 470 guys as opposed to 40 people who wanted to kill him, you know, God, God is just amazing. You know, you come, this few people you want to uh, destroy his people, and then he has vast and vast amount of people to, to protect his very own. Uh, Paul rode as a king, I tell you, going to uh, Felix. They wanted to judge him wrongly, and they still want to come and continue with that. The first verse says, now after five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders, and a certain orator or lawyer named Tertullius. This gave evidence to the governor against Paul. Now we see we have accusation against the apostle Paul. They wanted to kill him. If they, if they would have succeeded, you know, this part would have not been here because now they have to find something to try to pin the apostle Paul down. They assembled for this purpose. These Jewish leaders included Ananias, the high priest, the elders, and a skilled lawyer to present their case. I mean, just think about it for a moment. You're just a lay person who, you know, just going on with their business, you're being mindful of what you do, serving the Lord, and you have this counsel. You have to stand, actually you're standing before this kind of people. This is the high priest, the most regarded man, religious leader in the whole land, the high priest. You have the elders who rule the matters of religion. And you have a very skilled lawyer. <laughs> I mean, what are the chances that you're gonna go through? What are the chances that your case is going to be, you know, uh, your case is gonna stand? This 
gave evidence to the governor against Paul, convicting Paul of things that are not really true. The second verse says, and when uh, he, he was called upon, Tertullius began his accusation, saying, seeing that through you we have enjoyed great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. First of all, we're going to realize very soon that these words that this man is speaking are not true. Most noble Felix, this is how this lawyer is addressing Felix. You know, this guy called Felix began life as a slave. His brother, whose name was Pallas, was a friend of the emperor Claudius. And through such influence, he rose in status. First, as a child, gaining freedom, and then through um, intrigue, he became the first former slave to become governor of a Roman province. This is a big deal. He was a slave, now he's a Roman uh, governor of a prince, of a province. But his slave mentality stayed with him. A Roman historian called Tacitus described Felix as a master of cruelty and lust who exercised the power of a king with the spirit of a slave. This was this Felix guy. So the picture that is drawn to us, his public and private life, is not a pretty one, is not a good one. Indulge in very bad things. And so he says here, this lawyer, seeing that through you, we have great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. These were lies presented as flattery. Don't we guys use flattery for many, many things? <laughs> we want to flatter people. Felix did not bring peace or prosperity to those he governed. In reality, he, Felix, had put down several ins um, insurrections with such barbarous and brutality that he himself, he earned the title of horror, not honor, to the people that he uh, led. And in particular, he ordered a massacre of thousands of Jews in um, Caesarea, with many more Jews' homes looted by Roman soldiers. Is that a guy that seems like he brought peace and prosperity? <laughs> Yet, they say, most noble Felix. We're going to realize too soon that he's not noble. He's not noble. You know, flattery is often a sin that is neglected, or we don't think about it as sin. It's one that the Bible speaks about more often. In Romans uh, 16, verses 18, speaks to us of those who do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Flattering words. Jude also says it. Jude 1.16 speaks of those who mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. In other words, 
those who speak flattering words, the end result is they want to gain profit. They want to gain something from you. And I gotta warn us, especially the ladies, be warned when guys just show up and they're flattering words. They always come pre-planned. They always have an idea of what they wanna talk about, what they wanna tell you. Most of the time, it's not true, right? Most of the time is flattery because they want to gain advantage from you. You will realize that too quick when you know you have discernment to know that these are just flat out lies. You know why why do we wait until our hearts are broken to realize that oh he wasn't real. <laughs> he wasn't true. He was lying to me. We, we got to have sensitivity to know these things way early. Otherwise, our lives are going to be wasted. The Bible speaks of this thing. So, you know, the book of Proverbs especially connects flattery with the sin of sexual immorality. That this, you flatter people and your intention is what? To get to them. To get to them. You don't have good motives. You don't, you're not intending well for them. You want to gain advantage of them. Proverbs 2019 says, He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secret. Therefore, do not associate with the one who flatters with his lips. Friends, this means that we aren't to make flatterers of our friends. Don't flatter people. It is a sin. If you are to speak, speak the truth. Don't flatter people. Ah, yeah, if you hear people flattering you at the back of your mind, know that they are sinners. <laughs> They want to lie. And you know the father of all liars? is Satan, their father. So you're like, you'll say, ah, I know your daddy. <laughs> I know your father. He spoke these flattering words. And do you know what? In Psalm 78, verses 36, says that we can even flatter God. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth and they lied to him with their tongues. Friends, when you give God insincere praise, it is called flattery. God says to the children of Israel that they worship me with their mouth while their hearts are far away. They're not real, that is flattery. So we, you know, these things are not complicated. When, when I tell people things that are not real, you think I'm ignorant about it? I know it. I know that what I'm telling them ain't the real deal. And it's flattery and it is sin. So the people who are gathering to bring uh, Accusation against Paul, they're just driving down and drowning into sin. Sin after sin. Saying things that are not true. And I suppose even Felix himself was wondering, did I do that? <laughs> did, did I bring prosperity really to these people? Did, did I bring peace? I'm, oh, where do these people come from? They don't know who I am. Have people ever flattered you with things that you know that they're not real? You're like, huh, oh, that, that ain't me one minute. But because he wants to, in a way, please them, 
He's not shutting them because when people begin to do these things, you got to cut it off immediately. Cut it off so that they don't continue. Shut it. Paul accuses, you know, they state now their charges from verses 5. Say, for we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world. Wow. And a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple. And we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. <laughs> oh man, we found him. We found this man a plague. <laughs> Charges against Paul were essentially that he was politically dangerous. He was a threat to them. A plague, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. And that he profaned the temple. You know, ancient Judea was filled with what they would call the would-be messiahs. A lot of them are people who proclaim themselves to be great, people who proclaim to be the Jesus, the Messiah. There were a lot of them. And also we had uh, revolutionaries against Rome. And Tertullius wanted to put Paul in the same group with this kind of terrorists so that the, the, the governor would think ill of him, nothing good of him. A ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. You know, this also, the, the, the reference to Paul being a Nazarene was intended to connect him to a generally despised place, a low place, Nazareth. It was a, a, time, a, a time of slight scorn used for the followers of Jesus Christ because Nazareth had a poor reputation as a city. In John, the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, verses 19, a guy called Nathaniel asked his friend Philip, say, is there anything good that can proceed or come from Nazareth? Because we have a Nazarene, he's calling us to follow. Is there anything good? Very despised city, very despised people, nothing good. And you're wondering, like, so are we called for any good? I mean, all over the world, people know us as nothing. <laughs> I was born in Langas, born in Kambinguru, <laughs> born in, in the Masagari down there. Is there anything good that can come out of this bad location, this bad, wicked person? And perhaps we've thought that, right? Is there anything good that, that, that can come out of my town, my clan, my family, myself? You guys remember Gideon in the Bible? <laughs> when God called him who? Mighty man of valor. He said, no, 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 you're mistaken. <laughs> I'm not the one. For my family is the least of the smallest tribe. So we can go ahead and say all these things. And people can also use this to lure us. They can use this to take advantage of people, to flatter people. Do you know a lot of flattery, especially with the politicians, they take them to this neighborhood, you know, to Langers, you there and you know flatter people with a few words and then they give, give them you know a hundred bob and all that and like people will call your name they shout your name you've given them a little money they don't go to the elite people who live this side of town who knows them they want people that they can take advantage of and uh, saying all these very horrible things about 
uh, Paul and you know, his sect, the sect of the Nazarene. He, he, they say that he even uh, tried to profane the temple. This was actually the only really specific charge against Paul, but Tertullius gave no evidence for this charge because there was no evidence. <laughs> so dude, the smartest guy in the room has no evidence. So all of them, they're turning themselves into fools. All of them. Nothing good. Paul had nothing to fear from the truth. But he knew that the truth does not always win in this kind of courts. He's not afraid of the truth, but he knows his kind of truth does not win in their courts. But he's going to say it anyways. He's going to state it anyways. Significantly, the same man who found it easy to flatter also found it to accuse with no evidence. <laughs> down the drain is just going, it's worse going down there. It's flattering the governor and then there's no evidence. So what are you talking about? What, what are the charges? What, what, there's nothing really. They just are afraid that their politics have been messed up. There's a guy who has influence and they do not appreciate it. They don't appreciate it. So he concludes this lawyer. But the commander, Lysias, came by and with great violence took him out of our hands commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were true. So they brought now the commander in the picture. You know, the commander, the Roman commander, Lysia, who rescued Paul, was here put into a very bad light. That is not what he did. Say he snatched him from us when we wanted to judge him according to our law. Do you think they wanted to judge Paul according to their law? No, they wanted to kill him. They had vowed <laughs> not to eat, not to drink. But this is what they're saying here. So it's lies against lies and lies and lies. By examining yourself, you may ascertain all these things which we accuse him. They didn't even have outside evidence for these charges. You know, one thing that he hoped for, that Paul would incriminate himself under examination by Felix. You know, sometimes we want to trap people by words. You say this, you accuse them by this, and then they get confused, and they just say, well, I guess I'm guilty. <laughs> I guess it's good for me just to let it be. His hope was that Paul would be entangled, and Paul would incriminate himself. But that was not the case. The tables did turn so quickly. And then re let's read uh, Paul's defense here. Verses 10 to 13. Paul exposes the weakness of these people against him. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. 
And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogue nor in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. The Paul said, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. This is real talk. Um, I don't have lawyers. I don't have the religious leaders. I don't have any priests. I don't have any clever person with me. Paul knows he's not alone. But he says, whatever I'm going to do right now, I do it cheerfully. Think about it, friends. You're brought before this council, all these accusations, and you got to defend yourself. Many people will freak out, and you say words you're not supposed to say, and they will trap you. And this is normally their intention. You know, the, the, the things that politicians do, they say this word, they say this word. You know, the internet never forgets. <laughs> the internet is clever, never forgets. You say this, and then you turn around, and they say, hey, did you, didn't you say this? No, 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 that is not what I meant. You know that, ah, he's a real politician. <laughs> the real politician. Paul says, I do the more cheerfully answered myself. Paul was happy to answer for himself, knowing that the, the facts of the case were in his favor. And also we got to notice that Paul did not use flattery when he was addressing Felix. No flattery. As opposed to these guys, Paul is straight. This is what happened. This is why I am brought here. No flattery at all. They cannot prove anything of which they are accusing me of. Now Paul explains and why he's arrested. Verses 14. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, you guys remember the way? The beginning of this book, the believers, those who accepted the Lord, they were called the people of the way. Why? Because Jesus said it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So that according to the way which they called a sect, so I worshipped I worshiped the God of my Father, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. Now after many years, I came to bring alms and offering to my nation in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple. Neither with the mob nor with tumult, they ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. Or else, let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council. Unless it is for this one statement which I cried out standing amongst them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. Wow. What a defense from a person who is not fearful and what we're talking about, our topic today is suffering for righteousness. We are going to suffer a lot for doing what is right. And Paul is not budging. Paul is just saying it as it is. Paul knows when he was brought 
before the council, we discussed that last week before the Sanhedrin, he threw a grenade and he split them. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now he has the Sadducees who believes in the resurrection. They are following him to this council and he say, I got you. You believe in what I believe. I still follow my forefathers. I believe in the resurrection. For, and for that reason, I cried out about this thing called the resurrection. And now I am being judged by you this day. Paul made it clear that he had not abandoned the God of his fathers or the law and the prophet. Instead, he acted in fulfillment of them. He was in the temple. You remember with those four guys who had made a vow and they shaved their heads, their hairs presented to the temple to be burned and they sacrificed. He said, I did not neglect all that stuff. I still did it. Meaning I'm true. But they, they don't want to get that part. All they want is, you know, to accuse. And they call Christianity the sect of the Nazarenes. <laughs> the sect of the Nazarenes. In Acts 24. Five. But you know what? Paul called it the way. Are you the people of the way? Or which way are you following? You're following Jesus Christ or you're following others apart from Jesus Christ? Friends, there will be a resurrection of the dead. This was believed by most devout Jews of Paul's day, though not by the Sadducees. They were the only ones who never believed in the spirit. After you die, you cease. Paul believed that there will be a resurrection of both. The just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. And this kind of idea messes a lot of people's minds because people want to indulge, say, well, I want to do what I want to do with my life, with my body, because when I die, life ceases, right? But here is a reminder that there will be a resurrection of both. Those who believed and those who did not believe. Why is that important? <laughs> because there is eternity to both. Those who believe and those who did not believe. So upon the resurrection of these two groups, one group enjoy eternity with God, the other group Enjoy eternities without God. That would be fun, right? <laughs> Eternity without God is no fun. There's a lot of corruption and a lot of things happening in this world. But you know, this world still has order because God's presence is here with us. If God's presence will be taken away from this planet, it will be held. That is the definition of hell. A place without God. Without the presence of God. That will be chaos. And so friends, I would encourage you, as Josh even said, if you're amongst us and you haven't really made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, make a decision to follow Christ. To follow him who said, I am the way the truth, and the life. Paul is here reminding us of this facts. Say, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged this day. So 
So when he was going to Jerusalem, he's going to talk about that in Galatians chapter 2, verse 10, or Romans 15, 26, or 2 Corinthians 8 through 9. So I came to bring arms. This is a reference or refers to the collection Paul made for Judea Christians amongst the Gentile churches of the West. But that was a, a pretty good defense that Paul gave there. The reason why he, these people want him is because he believes in the resurrection. It says in verses 22, but when Felix had these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, look at that. Felix, who is just a Roman uh, governor, he knows more about the way than these religious leaders who are trying to pin down the Apostle Paul. Like, no, no, no. What, what I've heard about this way is not what is being presented with these guys. Having more accurate knowledge about the way, he adjourned the preceding and said, when Lysias the commander comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide and to provide for or to visit him. In other words, Paul is bound, but he's not free. <laughs> we have corners, we're watching him. Let If his friends want to visit, they come and visit. But he's still under custody, house arrest. But you see here, Felix is avoiding making a legal decision. He's supposed to make a decision. He had both parties, and he knows the way, how they do things. He's had accusations that have no foundation. He can think straight, but he's running away. He say, ah, when the commander shows up, we shall come back to this. That is not right. Felix avoided a decision under the pretense of waiting for more evidence through the Roman commander. Let him have liberty. Yet, knowing Paul's innocence, he granted Paul generous liberty even while he was still held in custody. You're here and you, you can't go. You can't go and do your own things. Felix tried to walk on a middle, middle ground. He knew Paul was innocent, yet he did not want to identify himself with Paul's gospel and the Christian, so he made no decision and kept Paul in custody. You guys know that making no decision is making a decision, right? <laughs> no, I was there, I didn't contribute. <laughs> if you could have contributed, things would have gone maybe a way better way than you just entertaining things that ain't right to say, well, I didn't contribute, I didn't say a word. Sometimes, or many times, cowards will do that. I don't want trouble. I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this. No, 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 no. Don't be like that. You know, in Revelation it says, the Lord does not like it. He will spit you out. Lukewarmness. He does not like it. Verses 24. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drasila, 
who was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and had him concerning faith in Christ. So Paul <laughs> went on and preached hard to these guys. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and he answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I'm going to call you. <laughs> isn't, isn't it a, a clever way we use to dismiss people when we, want, we don't want to talk to them, we don't want to encourage Hey, when I got time, right? I'm going to call you. <laughs> I'm busy, I'm busy. Give me a minute. I'm going to call you. <laughs> he says, hey, at the very convenient time, the, the, the question is, when will be this convenient time? You think you have tomorrow? You think you own God? And you can arm twist him and say, hey, I just add me one more day. Just do this. You do not have another day without God. Whatever he's provided for us, we ought to be grateful. When it's convenient, I woke up. Do you know why he was afraid and he was shaking and trembling? Paul talked about Jesus Christ and the important thing that he mentioned were about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. You know, these three aspects, they really hit home when he was speaking to Felix. Why? Because the woman is, is, who is mentioned, Drusilla, he took her from another man. <laughs> you took someone else's wife, there's no righteousness in you. There's no self-control in you, and there's judgment to come. He's going to fear. And those, those of you who are, no, they're not here. You know those guys, you know, husband snatchers and wife snatchers out there? There's judgment to come. Judgment is awaiting. You're walking in righteousness. You got self-control. Be reminded that these things, you know, the Lord just doesn't say, ha, ah, forget about that. We will give account of how we walked here. We will give an account. So don't let the enemy play tricks with your mind. Say, oh, we, that's not possible. I mean, does God have the time for seven billion people to start tabling things? <laughs> he got the time. He lives outside time, within time, no time, he's there. <laughs> so our time is no problem. He can judge the whole world in one minute and hears every one of us <laughs> with no problem. And this caused this guy to be afraid. For he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. These things will get even us right in this room to be afraid. I don't know what you did. I don't know what you have done. If you were to be brought before the court, before the Lord, a righteous judge, <laughs> will you be found guilty or not guilty? You'll be like, yeah, guilty as judged. <laughs> he avoided making a spiritual decision here. This was the moment for him to say, hey, I had those guys. Whatever they're saying ain't true. I have had you and the testimony of the people of the way. I want to believe. I want to follow this Jesus. I want to follow this Nazarene. <laughs> I want to be part of this sect, the sect of the Nazarene. He did not. He ran away. As many people would run away and say, oh, I'm not ready for the day. I'm not ready. Meanwhile, as he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, 
that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. Now, this tells us the heart of this man. The reason why he is holding Paul is not because he has offended the law. It is because he wants money. He wants money. Do you know that this small, small money people give them and they, they get around things, you know, give a hundred bob and they'll release you. They won't take you to court, right? Just, do you guys know how we, I don't know if I have any money, let me, let me see. You guys want some? <laughs> yeah, nobody says no <laughs> to money. You know what we do when we find ourselves in this situation? You are actually speeding, okay? You've actually offended the law. You've done something, you've crossed a solid line you're not supposed to. You know what we do? We take that money. Can you guys see it? You begin to have the alligator kind of arms. Because you don't want to go in there. You know this 100 bob is going to buy you your freedom and you're not going to spend six months in jail or pay this kind of fine. The hundred bob or the thousand bob is not even breathing right in your hand. <laughs> no air coming through. But because it's the, the easiest way out, we do it. You know you can buy your way out of that situation. But you know what? The Lord is watching. <laughs> he knows your heart. He knows what you're doing. And we're going to bring things to account. These kanju people, they came to your shop, like <laughs> the alligator arts, and they go. And you know the problem is, if you give them once, you become a well. <laughs> you'll always wanna give. And if you've given them before and they know you, you'll always be giving. You don't have, you don't stand a chance. You cannot prove yourself in a sense. Why? You've given them before. So you better not start it. For those who started, you better repent. Say hallelujah. <laughs> you better repent. It's going to land you in a lot of trouble. Paul is like, I'm not giving you this 100 bob. I'd rather stay two years in jail. And you know he was down there for two years because he didn't give bribe. This governor wanted bribe so that Paul would be released. Because there was no charge. There was nothing against him. And it says here that after two years, uh, Portius Festus succeeded Felix. And Felix wanted to do the Jews a favor, so he left Paul in there. <laughs> Imagine. He wanted to do the, the Jews a favor. So if Paul had paid money, then there's no favor for the Jews. So everyone is in there for what they get, not for the service of people. I feel like I want to throw this money to young people. No, 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 I can't. My wife will kill me. <laughs> Friends, What, what kind of Christians are we? What kind of believers are we? Christianity or Christians should never be timid or ashamed of the truth. Never be ashamed. Never be timid about the truth. You know the truth? Speak it. As the worship team comes. Speak the truth and it will set you free. 
Don't be, you know, you're trying to find middle ground. I want to please this group of people. I want to please this. No. You should be concerned about pleasing the Lord. Pleasing the Lord. The same, same people who will be crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. The same people, crucify, crucify. The same exact people. And the Lord knows it, and he wants you to do right. You know, the Bible tells us that righteousness exalts the nation. He didn't say, you know, if the president is right, say righteousness. And that one springs off the church. If the church ain't doing it, the politician ain't going to do it. Oh, we have corrupt. I mean, it's, it's, it's not news that they're corrupt. <laughs> that is all they do. But if we are corrupt, then that's a big problem. It's a bigger problem. We don't have straight paths. I want to be with Paul to entertain the Christian. When I come to a Christian gathering, I burn us a few of them. When I go to these other guys, you both ways. That one does not please God. James says that a double-minded person can never receive anything from the Lord. Never. To friends, maybe there's a place where you have compromised. As we bow our heads, we have compromised for whatever reason. We didn't stand for righteousness. We didn't do what was right because we thought that was the way out. But you know, as the Bible clearly tells us, no temptation comes our way that the Lord has not provided a way out. There's always a way out. But sometimes it's difficult for us. Sometimes we don't like it. Sometimes it costs our time. Sometimes it causes our money and resources. But at the end of the day, what, what, what do you choose to do? You follow Jesus or just let it be? Standing for what is right or just let things flow? The Lord really he is mindful about us. That is why he speaks to us. He uses men like Paul to tell that if it, if it was possible with him, it is possible. It is possible that he can take us out of all this trouble. And even when we find ourselves inside this trouble, he's still God anyways. He's still our king. He still reigns supreme. So if there is anything that you want to take to the Lord, take this moment to bring it to the Lord. He hears us. He's a faithful God. Our gracious God, we thank you for the privilege. We thank you that you have spoken to our hearts. I pray that you'd give us the confidence as your word says that the, the, the righteous are as bold as a lion. We don't have our own boldness. We don't have our own righteousness. Everything we got proceeds from you and we ask the Lord you'd help us, Lord. Those who have drawn back, I pray the Lord you'd bring them back. And I know you're calling them, Lord, even now, even today. I pray that your voice will not be missed by the, the noises that we hear from other people and the enemy. I pray, your oh God, that our hearts will be tuned to know your voice, to know you more and to make you known. So we bless you, God. Thank you for 
speaking to us. And as we serve you with our offerings today, we pray that we'll give a glorifying percentage to you. Percentage that will bring glory to you and also as we use it to further your gospel. So bless us as we do so in Jesus' name, amen.